such as Trafalgar and Parliament Square and Whitehall. Well, Bloomberg's own Olivia Stearns uh, is in Trafalgar Square. And Olivia, what is the plan for the protest today? And are you seeing a uh, traffic jam right now? Good morning, Benny. Well, the plan is for in about an hour's time, thousands of taxi drivers, thousands of black cab drivers to descend here upon Trafalgar Square and to start circling this area, going down to Whitehall, going down to Parliament Square. Betty, if thousands of cabs do in fact show up, these are key arteries of traffic in central London. It really could cause an extraordinary amount of gridlock. But you know what? These drivers, they are angry. They say Uber is operating illegally. Uh, they have to jump through all sorts of hoops to earn uh, and to pay for their licensed taxi meters, whereby Uber has just come in and done what they please. This is largely symbolic, though. This will be decided in a court a few weeks from now. Uh, but today really is just about voicing their discontent. Earlier, I spoke to the head of the London Taxi Drivers Association. He had just come from Scotland Yard. Listen to what he told me. In London here this afternoon, I've been threatened with arrest. 10,000 taxi drivers, black cab drivers in London, are being threatened with arrest by the Metropolitan Police for driving on their own streets. Is that the sort of power that Uber now have? Is this the amount of money it, 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 that it buys? It buys the police force as well as transport for London? What's going on in this city? Uh, so, Betty, I pointed out with the valuation issue that this is, of course, a startup. It hasn't been worth $17 billion for too long. Um, and he said that wasn't the issue. Really, what this is about, is it about a manifestation against what has been a very successful disruptive technology breaking into a very heavily regulated industry. Betty? All right, Olivia, thank you so much. Olivia Stearns there in London on all the protests happening against Uber. Well, I want to get back to the AIG story and about them naming Peter Hancock as its next CEO, replacing Bob Ben Moshe, who came out of retirement in 2009 to lead the insurance recovery from the financial crisis. Well, my next guest served as the Treasury Special Master of TARP Executive Compensation and worked with and at times against Ben Moshe on pay packages for AIG executives. Ken Feinberg joining me, known as the pay czar, the founder and managing partner of Feinberg Rosen, joins me now exclusively with more. Ken, uh, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Glad to be here. Okay, so first off, your reaction to, uh, to to Ben Moshe and this succession plan. You think it's orderly? It's orderly. A tough shoes to fill. Bob Ben Moshe, uh, during the 16 months that I was a treasurer on executive pay, was the most effective negotiator on behalf of any of those top corporate recipients of uh, taxpayer funds. And uh, I wish Peter well. Those are tough, tough shoes to fill. And he was effective against you, Ken. No, it wasn't really. He was an excellent negotiator. Humor. He knew the facts. He knew the consequences. He understood the tension between the politics of uh, populist resentment right. to the top bailout of AIG and the need to keep his employees in place and not bolt to other competitors. And he was very, very effective. He knew everything about the company. He came prepared to Treasury. And we personally negotiated each and every uh, compensation package. Uh, he really uh, set the, the gold standard for this. Well, he said to you, and he said to uh, to those running TARP at the time, that he needed to pay his executives properly, that he could not be, the top executives could not be subject to some of the caps that were being put in place. In the end, Ken, those were the right decisions? I think so. I think we balanced the political outrage at the bonuses that had been paid to AIG employees with Bob's foresight, his vision, in understanding what the future held for the company. And each individual employee, we worked it out through a, uh, a negotiation process. What, what was most effective about Ben Moshe? You said he was one of the most effective negotiators. What was most effective? What was his tactic that you admired? He knew all, he knew the facts. He knew the facts. He came prepared. It wasn't simply, you know, from 30,000 feet. He came in and with each employee, he had a dossier. He had the information. He knew what he needed. He came up with creative, creative, alternatives to simply more money, less money. Um, 
he, he left Treasury impressing everybody. What's your big question now around AIG, Ken? The big question now is can the momentum be sustained? I told Bob that he was dreaming if he thought that, he, that the company would be able to repay its top taxpayer obligations. He was right. He was really? right. He managed to do it. Now, the big challenge for PETA is going to be further stabilization, moving forward, maintaining the momentum that uh, Bob brought to the company. Do you think the company, now that it's out of government oversight, Ken, do you think that it has learned its lessons? It is a smaller company, not as much a threat to the financial system, but still a systemically important company. Do you think that they have learned their lessons and that you're confident they can go on without government, without direct government oversight? Well, that remains to be seen. The crystal ball's murky. I, I'm, uh, I wouldn't predict one way or the other. I would say that all indications from the past and the present is that Bob left the company in a position where it should be able to maintain that momentum. And Pete is in charge. Pete knows the company, and he knows what has to be done. Uh, fingers crossed, but obviously in America, companies advance um, on their own in the private marketplace without the type of government intrusion that was necessary after time. Ken, do you know Peter Hancock? I've met Peter. I wouldn't know him the way I know Bob Ben Moshe for experience. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, my relationship with Bob was based on my work at Treasury. I've met Peter. That's about it. Uh, and you know but he certainly, he certainly has the resume, I must say, <laughs> and knowledge of the company. Uh, I would say that the outlook is promising, yes. Uh, and you have, it sounds like you have no uh, ill will or harbor any bad feelings at all uh, against Ben Moshe and the, and the fights, Ken, that came out in public later uh, that, that were well documented between you and Ben Moshe uh, about overcompensation. You, you have no ill will towards him on that. Ill will? I, uh, I uh, have no ill will at all. As a matter of fact, uh, I salute Bob and Moshe. We had disagreements, of course. We had disagreements. I had a Treasury mandate from Congress. Bob had a mandate from his board and from the company. We worked it out. That's what negotiation and give and take is all about. And I have and not only no ill will, I have the highest respect for Bob and Moshe. Uh, Ken, people look to you as uh, as someone who is the go-to person, uh, not just talking about uh, about compensation, but also uh, on, on victims' compensation, but from the 911 fund to BP, and now I know you're working on General Motors. Uh, first off, on compensation, do you think it's it's gotten way out of hand on Wall Street since those days when you negotiated the pay for AIG? Well, I think executive compensation is, is still higher than it should be, but that's the free market. That is the Adam Smith and the laissez-faire system. I think that the gap between Wall Street compensation and Main Street compensation is conspicuous. It is uh, um, obvious, and I think it's too high, but only the free market can correct that system. And you don't see that reversing at any point, Ken? Well, if the market reverses right now, uh, the argument is you get what you pay for. The market is soaring. Wall Street is thriving. Main Street is still very iffy. Uh, but but um, this is the way the system works. You can't expect government to interfere the way we did at Congress's demand after the top uh, bailout. You can't expect government to monitor how Wall Street executives get paid on a daily basis. That's the function of private markets. And uh, it is a problem, but it's a problem that we've had for the last uh, over 200 years in this country, and it's going gonna, gonna to continue, I think. Uh, Ken, to the extent that you can, can you tell me how it's going so far with assessing the victim's compensation for General Motors? It's going very well. Uh, as I've said publicly, uh, by the end of this month, we will establish a compensation program that will define who's eligible to file a claim with this uh, fund that I'm creating. 
what the dollars will look like for those who do file, the obligations that they will have, the claimants, to prove their claim. And we will, uh, as expeditiously as we can, uh, start to uh, pay eligible claims. GM, I must say, has delegated to me, uh, without any uh, ambiguity here, full discretion to evaluate each individual claim, make a determination, and pay those claims that are eligible. And that program should kick in, as GM has demanded, uh, around August 1. So you can be paying claims as soon as then, or would it take a little while after? Oh, it'll take a little while after. I would hope by August 1, we would invite claimants to file a claim. There'll be a claim for There'll be the rules governing the filing claims. I am now uh, collecting input and advice from GM officials, from plaintiff lawyers, from claimants themselves. What should a compensation program, what should the structure look like? And by the end of this month, we should have a program uh, in place. Then we'll prepare the documentation, the claim forms, the rules, and I hope that we will begin to uh, welcome the submission of claims uh, by August 1, per GM's timetable. Ken, I know it's still early, very early, but uh, is the price tag for this going to be astronomical? Are the shareholders going to gasp at how much is going to have to be paid out? commented is rather early. Um, I think, first of all, we have to decide. The price tag is at the end of the process. First, who's eligible to file a claim? Who's eligible? Second, once the claim is filed, what will be the methodology? How will we calculate what the individual claimant should receive? Third, how many claimants? And if you add the number of claimants to the methodology we're going to use to calculate uh, damages, yes. that will give you some rough aggregate estimate. Who is this guy? But this program can't go on forever. I mean, I think that if we start by August 1, we want to have a relatively modest timetable to invite claimants to file their claim or their families or their loved yeah. ones. Get Ken, those claims Ken, evaluated Ken, and paid. Ken, so we've we've got to make get... sure to talk about that. Got your track.
Feinberg for this exclusive interview. Ken Feinberg, as you know, is running the Victims uh, Compensation Fund for General Motors. Ken, I apologize for earlier. You know, I can do many things in this program. One thing I can't do is change our commercial breaks. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, you were uh, finishing your comments about about how how the, the price tag of uh, of what these claims could be. And as you mentioned, you're describing the process. Um, you know, at the end of all of this, though, do you, do you have any idea? Can you can you estimate at all, Ken? Uh, how much we're talking about, or, or is this going to be a game-changing number for General Motors? The answer is no, I can't estimate it. First of all, we haven't got the rules in place yet. We're gathering information about what the program should look like. Secondly, even after you have the program in place, who is applying? Who's actually going to submit the claims? And third, even if they submit a claim, is the claim corroborated? Is it provable? So it's very premature to be talking about aggregate numbers yeah. until there's more detail as to what the program look like, looks like and who's filing the claim. Uh, who's working with you on this, Ken? How many people do you have working on this? Oh, no, this is a very small group. I, I have uh, <laughs> uh, my colleagues uh, working close.